Welcome everybody. I am Dr. Crystal Downing, co-director along with my husband, Dr. David Downing of the Wade Center. And we recently had the honor of conversing over dinner with tonight's speaker, Dr. Olga Lukmanov Lukmanova, <laughs> who is visiting from Russia. During our five-hour marathon, we found Olga to be absolutely brilliant. Brilliant in her second language. <laughs> For me, the hardest part of grad school was having to pass three foreign language exams. And I still remember the moment when I discovered that this phrase I had been reading, sest moi, was actually supposed to be pronounced c'est moi. <laughs> Olga can not only speak English beautifully, but she also delivers profound insights with it, which makes it somewhat ironic that I, a linguistically challenged individual, is introducing her, <laughs> Sest Moy. <laughs> we do have one thing in common, and that is we both highly value the Russian philosopher Mikhail Bakhtin. Um, <coughs> Bakhtin was key to my argument in two books, and so that was a fun connection that we had, never and still have. Nevertheless, one of my greatest miseries in grad school was having to translate two books from French into English, uh, Zola's Le Ventre du Paris, I mean, <laughs> Le Ventre du Paris, along with Victor Hugo's Hunchback of Notre Dame. <coughs> Olga has willingly, willingly translated over 60 books from English into Russian, including Basic Christianity by John Stott, Knowing God by J.I. Packer, The Purpose Driven Church and the Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren, and various books by Richard Foster. In 2012, she published the first ever Russian monograph on George MacDonald, entitled Biblical Images, Symbols, and Motifs in George MacDonald's Fairy Tales. Olga is associate professor at the Linguistic University of Nizhny Novgorod <laughs> in Russia, where she earned her PhD in English literature in 2012, and where she includes writings of George MacDonald and other of our Wade authors in her classes. Olga has researched at the Wade Center numerous times, including a six-month visit as a Fulbright Scholar in 2014 and 15. We are so delighted to have her back, to hear her reflect on how the Wade authors have changed her life. Please welcome her with me. What a kind introduction. Ce n'est pas moi, non? I don't speak French. <laughs> no, thank you so much, Crystal, uh, for this amazing introduction. It's uh, quite unbelievable. Thank you so much for coming today. And um, thank you, uh, Windsor Park uh, residents, for making it through the rain. Um, and it's going to be for you another personal reflection. It's not going to be terribly academic. I hope you're not in the mood for anything academic. It's going to be very personal um, because it's basically about uh, living and serving with the Wade authors. And again, every experience like this is intensely personal. So I just hope that uh, you share this little journey with me. And if one person decides to read something by any of the authors, I'll be very excited. <laughs> It'll be time well spent. Uh, well, uh, I called this friends and masters, living and serving with the Wade authors. 
Uh, a more precise title might have been One Acquaintance, Two Good Friends, and Four Great Loves, <laughs> because uh, about the seven uh, weight authors. And as any self-respecting researcher these days, the first thing I did was go to the uh, internet, of course, and I went to my own um, social media page. This is uh, the Russian version of Facebook called Vkontakte, in touch. And this is my profile page. And if you can see, personal information, favorite books, God Denied, Bassman's Honeymoon by Dorothy Sayers, books by C.S. Lewis, George MacDonald, Charles Williams. Uh, the quote, favorite quotes, the only Christian work is good work well done, Dorothy Sayers. Uh, this is my status line, has been for about four years. Love if you dare, if you dare not admit it, Charles Williams. Apparently, I quote them a lot. Uh, <laughs> I went, uh, this is, you know, the quotes, George MacDonald, George MacDonald, George MacDonald, <laughs> C.S. Lewis. And as you see, the quotes are all very, very different, uh, uh, you know, and these are on my page, you know, sort of my normal page. And when uh, I came to the Wade Center, actually I first came to Wheaton in 93 when the wardrobe was still in the Billy Graham Center. Uh, but when I came here in 2010 for the Eastern uh, European Summer Program, uh, I came to the Wade Center for the first time. And this is uh, the photograph that I posted on my, again, social media page because I, I like to share my experiences with my students and with my parents and with other friends. Uh, and I said, this is the Wade Center. And I posted some photos of the Wade Center and, you know, the favorite things. Um, and these are some of the comments. And you should, uh, I wish you could read the comments that I posted and people were like, no way, <laughs> really, seriously, the wardrobe, wow, Rippy Cheap, so cool, Dorothy said, really, Chesterton, wow, no way, all seven in one place, uh, do such places even exist? You, and my, my f students were all excited, and I have a student, I can't believe it's from the same, from the same tree, the apple tree. And this is my non-believing student from um, the <laughs> university. So, you know, uh, the excitement was palpable. Uh, this is from my Facebook page. I got my new books, what glory. Uh, Owen Barfield, Dorothy Sayers, C.S. Lewis, Charles Williams. Yeah, my, my social media pages uh, really show that, you know, they are a huge part of my life, and you will see um, later why. I'm going to start uh, by, t I'm going to actually talk about all seven of them, if that's the case. So if it's going to be a whirlwind, it, well, it is, okay? Uh, how, do you, how do you talk about all of your loves? But I'm going to start with in order of appearance, if that's okay, like, a, like the cast in a movie, uh, how they uh, appeared in my life, but with one exception, uh, Owen Barfield, because he is the acquaintance. Uh, we had a friendly handshake. I appreciate the wisdom and the depth. I read only one of his books, Saving the Appearances, and I remember the incredible depth and the brain power uh, necessary to just even understand the concepts of participation and you know idolatry and all of that. And I read it at the English Libri, and I remember retelling the book at the English Libri table. How do you retell saving the appearances? I, I honestly don't remember. I need to come back to it one day. So we had a friendly handshake. We're good acquaintances with Oren Barfield. Uh, the next person to appear in my life was uh, uh, Tolkien. I was 15. The year was 1985. And my father, uh, who is a great reader, he gave me a present for my birthday in July. 85, I'm 15, and my father gives me this book. Uh, and it's the Fellowship of the Ring. Uh, and that's all I remember about that birthday. He gave me the book, I opened the book, I sat down, and I was just lost to the world. I mean, completely lost to the world. And I cannot tell you what that book did to me back then. Uh, I will never forget that whole dread, the atmosphere of dread and evil, you know, the Nazgul, you know, the, the whole, uh, the, the darkness, it was palpable, and then the, the Rivendell, the beauty of the elves, and then the music, and then darkness again, and everything was just about to crash, and then boom, everything is good again. And, but the whole, uh, the sweep of history was amazing. And I remember watching the first film and thinking, oh, they 
butchered my book. I mean, what did they do? Uh, <laughs> but uh, because it was like they didn't even show the half of it. They, you know, and how do you show that dread, that that whole atmosphere? Uh, but you know, I made peace with it by film three. Fine, you're <laughs> fine. Uh, but. Um, the name I want to mention today is, these are the translators. These are the, trans, the first translators of Tolkien into Russian. And they were working even before Tolkien was allowed uh, in Russia. Uh, surreptitiously, somehow, Tolkien books made it to Russia. And they were, uh, I don't know if you know the term, uh, in, like under, underground publishing, some is that. And they would translate them by hand and they would rewrite them and copy them because you could, you could be imprisoned uh, potentially for doing something like this. And people would hand each other copies of, you know, handwritten uh, translation. So uh, they were doing this when it was not possible to publish this. So in 85, uh, when Mikhail Gorbachev uh, came to power, things became a little more possible. So when this book came out, the translators were ready, okay, to, to give the translation. So these are the people, some of the first translators uh, of Tolkien's work. Uh, in Russia. Uh, and of course, I don't need to tell you, there's a huge following of uh, Tolkien in Russia. I mean, huge following. But for me, uh, personally, uh, the, that whole sweep of history, the amazing understanding of the goodness of the foundation of the world, that the history had an end, and it was a good end. That the history, however dark the time was, there was the good was still stronger than the evil. And uh, the conversations that I remember, Tolkien is never far away from the mind, you know. And uh, why was I chosen? Such questions cannot be answered. I mean, Gandalf is like this embodiment of wisdom, uh, and the joy, the deep joy of Gandalf when he's laughing. Uh, and uh, like the whole, see, a fountain of mirth enough to set a kingdom laughing were to gush forth. Isn't that beautiful? And again, however dark it is, and sometimes it is really, really dark, the foundation, the backdrop is good and we're waiting for something that is good. I remember preaching in my church and talking about the beacons of Gondor. You know, and how people were faithfully waiting at the beacons, waiting to light them, maybe for decades, maybe for the centuries, and, but they were there. I was talking about faithfulness, but Tolkien helped me talk about faithfulness and just waiting. Uh, even if you don't light it for a year or two or three, anyway, you keep post and you keep faithful. Um, I will never forget how, uh, the, the Lord of the Rings, right? I mean, you've seen several journeys. Uh, Gandalf and company are doing one thing, Frodo and Sam are going off, and there are no GPS, there are no cell phones, they have no idea what's going on. Everything is done by faith. They really don't know what the other are doing. They have no idea. Aragorn starts the battle, he has no clue what has been happening. And yet everybody presses on, everybody keeps going uh, in faith. And to me that is just such a confirmation, such an affirmation of the goodness and of the big hand and the big purpose that embraces us all. And even Gollum, right? Even Gollum, uh, that Bilbo had, uh, Bilbo had pity on him, Frodo had pity on him, and then in the end, of course, um, hang on, the eucatastrophe, the famous term by Tolkien, the, the sudden happy end where everything seems that it, would, it just is wrong. Frodo is about to say that he, the ring is his, but no. Something else happened, completely unexpected. Um, Aragorn, uh, I don't know. Uh, Saint Ignatius is not here, you know, <laughs> for a random reason. Uh, I have been doing the, uh, I've been journeying with Saint Ignatius for the last two years and doing Ignatian exercise and giving Ignatian exercises to people in Russia. And one of the exercises encourages you to imagine the king and following the king. Guess which king came to mind, you know, first. It was, of course, Aragorn and Aslan. And so, yeah, Tolkien is never really far away. And then, of course, when I think, for example, about my students, uh, I have, I think, a promise from God, from Psalm 2. Ask of me, and I would give the nations as an inheritance for you. Uh, and I have asked God for all of my students, all of them, to come. 
uh, to Christ, to come to the faith, to be saved. So when I pray for them, I imagine them on the white shores, on the other end, coming to me. When I land on that ship, they're gonna come to me on those white shores. And the gray curtain of rain is gonna be drawn. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time reading to you, but uh, one last thing I'm going to say. Another favorite story is Leaf by Nigel. Do, do you know that story? Oh, I love that story. Uh, and it just gives me such hope that even if my life is small, even if it fe seems unfinished, uh, there is a reality, there is the big truth that is waiting for me there. And I will see my work, however small, however insignificant, however incomplete it is, it'll be completed then. Just recently, a, a favorite thought, everything, the proper doing of a thing is always beyond my reach, always. But that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. And one day, I'm going to see the tree, even if I'm busy painting the leaf right now. So, you know, uh, so yeah, Tolkien is a really, really good friend and somebody who teaches me about history and about faith and the good. And yeah, well, we Russians, we, we don't do anything by halves, you know, so <laughs> we have the eye of Sauron and mom. This is a joke, of course, but, uh, <laughs> and I, I do post a lot in Russian. I didn't translate everything. That would just take a long time. But it says, Tolkien wrote the first lines of The Hobbit when he was grading his students' papers. Ha! Huh, how much potential, op potential opens up. <laughs> uh, and again, I do love sharing little bits of translation from all of these authors with uh, the friends in Russia. So that's why so many posts. The second person that I encountered from the Wade authors was G.K. Chesterton. And G.K. Chesterton is really well known and really well loved in my country. Uh, he's been translated by Natalia Trauberg and by other uh, famous uh, translators. Uh, brilliant translations, really well loved. Whole, you know, you can buy Chesterton in any bookstore if you like. Uh, my first introduction to him, I think it was in my 20s, maybe before I became a Christian, uh, was uh, to Father Brown. And Father Brown, when I first read, I think, The Blue Cross, uh, uh, you, you probably are familiar, and then the hammer of God uh, and the sign of the broken sword. I was so compelled by this little person, by this little priest who was just completely unexpected, so humble and so sweet, but so creative in how he was using uh, his skills. But when I remember uh, when I was reading the hammer of God, it was the first time that I thought, wow, being true to yourself and sin is worse than prison. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but Father Brown really compels that person to give himself up to the police rather than uh, Father Brown wasn't going to. But the confession and being free from your own sin, from your own darkness, was more important and a better uh, thing than uh, a less scary thing than being in prison. It was better to be in prison but be free inside. That was a first for me. That was really good. And then I remember the horror at the deep, darkness of the human heart in the sign of the broken swords when a person buried a dead bo body under uh, an ocean of dead bodies. And I just remember thinking, oh my word, our heart is so dark. And then of course, Father Brown says, yes, it is. And that was his secret. He says, I try to imagine how I would behave if I were this person. And I, and I understand what happened and following the darkness, but not allowing the darkness to have the last word. That is just, uh, that's what Tolkien, uh, that's what Chesterton did for me. And of course, later when I became a Christian, I read all the other books, The Orthodoxy and uh, The Everlasting Man and uh, amazing eccentric fantasies and eccentric stories. And of course, Chesterton is the master of paradox and he's always fun to read, uh, uh, you know? The cross that I'm wearing today is so colorful, isn't it? Isn't it pretty? Uh, it reminds me of Chesterton, because he's so colorful, he's so robust, and he's so much fun. Uh, and he's always making you look from the other side. He says, you know, you want to see the world? You need to see it upside down. You need to see it from the other angle. You want to, you made a, made a bed to eat your hat? Okay, wear a cabbage. 
then eat the cabbage, you know, that's great. You know, jump down the chimney, uh, jump over the fence, uh, see what's going on. This is how you see reality. To see, to, to the, fur the further you go, you, to see the world, you need to come home. That's a very uh, familiar uh, idea. And uh, two other people that he introduced me to uh, that are uh, no, friends and favorites are St. Francis of Assisi and uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, I don't know if you read the little uh, books about them, but they are fantastic. I mean, you fall in love with these two, and you want to know more. And this is what he did for me. He introduced me to them, and I've loved them ever since. And of course, he's immensely quotable. Uh, uh, not uh, Warning, not everything that is attributed to Chesterton online is actually Chesterton. Just like not everything attributed to C.S. Lewis is C.S. Lewis. Um, but I did check. <laughs> I did check. But look at this, right? Master of paradox. Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and not tried. Isn't that true? He just has this way of getting to the point and doing it so well. You have this one-liner in your head then for years. Uh, there are no rules of architecture for a castle in the clouds. Isn't that cool? I'm incurably convinced that the object of opening the mind, as of opening the mouth, is to shut it again on something solid. I think it's really well said. Marriage is an adventure, like going to war. <laughs> you guys would know. <laughs> uh, the poets have been mysteriously silent on the subject of cheese. <laughs> I, I think he is enormous fun. He is just enormous fun, isn't he? And one of my favorite essays is about how, you know how our culture now, well, our culture and my culture, this is the same. They are calling us to believe in ourselves, believe in yourself. You know what Chesterton says? It's, the, it's madness, it's insanity to believe in yourself. It's, it's too puny, it's too futile. It's, but uh, what a different voice in our culture, and what a refreshing, vigorous, a robust, fun, colorful, impressionistic voice, isn't he? Yeah. OK. Are you guys OK? Yeah. Yeah. Not too fast? Nope. All good? OK. C.S. Lewis. This, uh, so the first Owen Barfield was the handshake, the acquaintance. Chesterton and Tolkien were really good friends. Now is the time for the four great loves. Okay, these four uh, have been uh, just enormously important for me. Um, uh, this is me, by the way, in I think '92, um, about four months before I became a Christian. Quite unexpectedly, I am a very reluctant convert, just like C.S. Lewis, uh, and. Uh, Here's a, a group that I was part of, my study group, that we worked together and studied together uh, in our last year of the university. And when I was in my last year of university and in the deep uh, darkness of an existential crisis, uh, because uh, the communists just fell, I, didn't, I lost all meaning of life, and it was quite difficult to go on, and I wasn't quite sure why one should even live and what the morality was anymore. A student of mine, uh, whose name was Andrei Yagin, and I didn't know that then, but he was one of the seven Christian students in my school. Um, they, they were not very vocal yet. It was 92. He gave me this book, and this is uh, C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity, published, by, I think, by Slavic Gospel Association. Again, they were very quick to supply us with books and Bibles. And I remember, uh, again, and I was allergic to anything Christian. I was an atheist through and through, just completely allergic, completely no opiate for the people, no. But you know, somebody gives you a book. You're grateful. Uh, you, you'll take a book, and I took the book, and I opened it up, and I read the first chapter, which is the law of human nature. And I remember thinking, man, that's really logical. That's really good. Wow, wow, the logic is clean. The argument is convincing. The, yeah, there has to be an objective morality. That's kind of cool. Close the book, put it back on the shelf. Never, <laughs> never really returned to it until much later. Uh, but uh, it did come later when I was trying to work out the implications of my faith in God, when I was uh, pushed 
to answer the question whether God was real, that came to me and I think I was able to work out and I think that was one of the main seeds that were planted. Uh, so C.S. Lewis was there even before I became a Christian. And this is why I use the law of human nature in my classroom. This is the text that I assigned to my students in September, so you can pray for them. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, we, because it's such a masterful argument uh, and we will look at how the argument is built and we talk about this. Of course, my students all say, uh, no, there is no such thing as the real right and the real wrong. And then we talk about this. Why not and what does that mean? So this is why, and again, I remember what this text did for me. And I hope it will do at least a smidgen of that for my students. Uh, and of course then, uh, in 93, 94, the flood of books started coming out and the Russian Orthodox Church and the Alexander Main Foundation did a great job getting the translations out. And these are, they produced an eight volume collection of C.S. Lewis and beautiful Russian. Uh, Natalia Trauberg was very instrumental in that. Uh, the screw tape letters till we have faces, the great divorce. Basically, I think the entire C.S. Lewis has now been translated into Russian, um, praise God. And I will never forget the first, you know how you first read C.S. Lewis, you just go, you know, <laughs> I remember uh, the screw tape letters, I went on a tram and I was reading it, I was crying, and I was laughing, it's like, <gasps> You know, I can't, I can't believe this. Uh, and as a friend recently who's just discovering C.S. Lewis, the same thing is happening to her. And she says, he's already said everything, hasn't he? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> basically, yes, he has already said everything. And he said everything so well, hasn't he? Uh, and this is why I quote him so much on my Facebook page. The first reward of our obedience, increasing power to desire the ultimate reward. Uh, something about uh, Tolkien, about C.S. Lewis, uh, etc. And yes, look at that quote. <laughs> One of my students read C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy, and the character he loved most was Weston. <laughs> Sob. <laughs> My student was a transhumanist. At least we had a discussion about this. Okay. <laughs> uh, I actually had two uh, of my senior students read the Space Trilogy this year with varying results. But again, I, don't, I love the Space Trilogy. They loved it too, so there you go. Good. <laughs> anyway, I post news. Uh, this is uh, liter literary works of C.S. Lewis published in Russia. Uh, I post some quotes for his birthday, you know, again, lots of posts because they're just good quotes. He has said everything and he has said everything so, so well. Uh, this is, by the way, Jerry, this is, uh, I don't know where you guys are going, but I'm running to Jerry's Roots lecture on <laughs> uh, Pilgrim's uh, Regress. <laughs> That's, that's it. Uh, and then this is the quote about the potential gods and goddesses and how it is, uh, uh, how we don't realize that every day we live with potential gods and goddesses and each one of us will be either the magnificent glory or the horrible, horrible awfulness that one cannot even contemplate. Uh, I translate bits and pieces from English into Russian so that my friends and my family and my students can read this and can enjoy it with me. And it's always surprising to see who likes them and who responds and who reads. You just never know, right? Uh, I was just leafing through McDonald's book from the library uh, of C.S. Lewis with his personal notes. For some reason, I'm proud of both of them. Who am I to be proud of both of them? But anyway, <laughs> you know? but anyway so uh, again, C.S. Lewis, uh, love and your heart will be broken. That's a very famous quote, right? Uh, but if you don't love, your heart will become unbreakable. So a lot of quotes, uh, a lot of wisdom to share, uh, more and more as you see. And this is one of my favorite quotes that I, co that I quote in every classroom that I'm in. I say, a real art of language is to say what you mean, exactly how you mean it. This is the fox from Till We Have Faces. And I love that quote. And I think it's the essence of teaching English. I'm teaching them to say e what they mean, exactly how they mean it, no more, no less. And C.S. Lewis is helping me. Uh, and like I said, you know, this, you know why? Because I assign out of the silent planet. 
in my classroom, an excerpt where Ransom translates, thank you, Ransom translates uh, the speech of Weston into uh, Malachandran, if you remember that. And we study this little text, and I give an assignment to, to think about translation techniques, uh, what has been done, how has culture been employed, and then we talk about political correctness and language. And uh, how do you know what is being said? Do you understand what is being said in modern lingo? Do you understand the essence behind the words? Because this is a very, very good exercise. And then some of them have come up to me and said, what was that? Who wrote this? Can we have more? And, and then the Space Trilogy comes in. This year, a student said, um, I'm going to be reading Paralandra this semester. And I said, Paralandra? Can you tell me more? My fiance wants me to read Paralandra. I'm like, well, maybe you should start with Out of the Silent Planet. It's a trilogy. So, so she did the whole thing. And she and her fiance apparently had many interesting discussions. <laughs> uh, but for me, again, so C.S. Lewis, uh, I cannot, uh, I'm going to quote, uh, I think, Peter Whimsey from Dorothy Sayers' novels. He says, you know, uh, I have a quote for everything. That saves the trouble of original thinking. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I have a quote from C.S. Lewis for about everything, because the man has said everything. Uh, and, uh, but another thing that really touches me about C.S. Lewis is actually his life. And I love reading his letters. Uh, I've read several biographies, of course, but I love reading his letters because the man really shines through uh, those letters. And uh, this is a quote from Facebook that I posted last year. Every human being, still more every Christian, has an absolute claim on me for any service I can render them without neglecting other duties. I'm in continued awe of the man. And that's just true. Uh, and of course, we all have read biographies and we know how he about the many little charities that he had, about many people who he supported without telling anybody. And I'm looking at him and going, wow, this is how I want to be. This is, this is what I want to be like. And then I know about the grueling grading. Every time I'm grading, I'm like, okay, C.S. Lewis graded too, and you know, the Hobbit story, you know. Uh, I know, but then uh, during the grading, the way he treated Mrs. Moore, the way he treated his students, the way he was with his friends, I'm looking at the man who's a university professor, well, kind of like me, a little bit, I mean, but, but yeah, uh, but he did this, he thought this, he was like this, and I want to be like this too. Uh, and then, uh, and then recently, I also discovered that he was on the same Ignatian journey as me. So I got all excited because he had a confessor, a Jesuit confessor. And I'm really, really grateful uh, because now I read his books. Like when I read Surprised by Joy, for example, right? Which, by the way, his friend said, um, his friend said, it shouldn't be called Surprised by Joy. It should be called Suppressed by Jack because <laughs> he, he uh, you know, revealed only certain things about himself. But I know why because he was looking for joy in his life. And this is a very Ignatian exercise. You look back and you find moments of joy, how God led you. And I read it now through that lens and go, oh yeah. And he's a fellow traveler around, uh, along that road and I'm very excited. And now I read this hideous strength very differently because I see little Ignatian journey there. You know, and it's just another another strand in our friendship. I'm just, it's unbelievably cool, can I just say. And what, you know what else is unbelievably cool? Is that I get to give C.S. Lewis to my friends in church and at the university. I have a friend who brings over cheap copies of C.S. Lewis in English to me quite regularly, so I can hand them out to my students. And I buy uh, as many as I can in Russian to lend and to give. And this is my church. And this lady, this is the lady, her name is Galina. She's the one who came to me and said, I gave her this to read. And this is the problem of pain, uh, letters to Malcolm, uh, the great divorce, uh, screw the letter, it's a collection. And she came to me and said, I can't believe it. I can't believe it, this is amazing. And she had no words and I can totally relate because I had no words and she's just discovering Lewis and she, uh, I, I think the book is going to make rounds in the church, you know, so, so this, is, this is such a delight. I'm almost jealous of anybody who has not yet read C.S. Lewis because they get to do it for the first time. Um, 
The next person uh, is George McDonald. And as many of us, I met George McDonald through C.S. Lewis. And again, Jerry, I'm going to quote you this time. Uh, you always say that when you read your master, your masters open doors to other masters. And that's exactly right, because these masters, they open doors to other books, to other worlds, to other people. And that's exactly what happened to me. Uh, I had read The Great Divorce in my first years of uh, Christian faith, and I loved it. I cannot tell you how much I loved it. But of course, there's this mysterious Scotsman whom C.S. Lewis meets, and C.S. Lewis behaves like I behave in C you know, around C.S. Lewis. Uh, I remember actually when I was 25, I met uh, Lady Elizabeth Catherwood, who studied under C.S. Lewis. And she said, oh yeah, I was in his class. And I was like, oh, <laughs> can I touch you or something? Is this okay if I stand nearby? I was like a little schoolgirl, girl, you know? <laughs> you know but, but well, yeah, he's a very, very favorite friend. So, and C.S. Lewis suddenly behaves like me, like a little schoolgirl, going, oh, you will tell me the truth. You will not deceive me. And I'm like, who is this man? Wow, who is this George MacDonald? Well, uh, in about 95, I think, or thereabout. This is the university where I work, by the way, the Linguistic University of Nizhny Novgorod. And I went to the research library, there it is, uh, to look for something else. And I was kind of browsing through the shelf, and then I saw a row of books just like this. And I, and I saw the name, George MacDonald. I was like, no way. I mean, really? So I pulled out a book, and sure enough, that was the guy. Scottish, you know, the C.S. Lewis said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, this is great. So I took my first uh, book, and I think either it was Malcolm or it was Sir Gibby, but I will never forget what it did for me. It was like, and it was 95. Uh, for me, it was a fairly dark time because um, it was about three years into my Christianity and to our church. And from Act 2, we went straight into 1 Corinthians, if that makes any sense. Uh, we hit every heresy under the sun. We didn't know how to lead because we were all former communists and we only led by... Um, Thank you. <laughs> uh, we didn't know what we were doing quite, quite seriously. So it was a fairly difficult time. And a lot of it didn't make sense. And then suddenly I opened the book and God just drips from every page. And he's so good. He's good. He is good. I mean, unbelievably good. And there is a sternness and there is this insight into character but there's this incredible grace and just fatherhood uh, that was unbelievable. I, again, I, I couldn't quite cope with myself. So what I did was I started translating bits and pieces. And you know how in McDonald's novels, there would be a plot, but then would be like a theological gem, like, or like a little paragraph that would be like a mini sermon. And those were just precious and so full of truth, so full of life. And in the midst of very, very poor teaching and very, very skewed teaching, this was like, like finding water in the desert. And I remember start, I started translating bits and pieces and I put them into a little book and gave it to a friend who is now my publisher. And I said, read this, read this. This is unbelievable. Uh, he read this and he said, we should translate this. We should, we, should, we should translate this. You should translate this. I'm like, are you joking? I mean, I was already translating Christian books, but George MacDonald, I mean, fiction, translating fiction and translating George MacDonald, I thought it was completely beyond me. But he kept pushing and he kept pushing. And lo and behold, uh, <laughs> now we have, uh, it's not much, but it's a good start. This is Sir Gibby, a Donald Grant, and Fantastis, and Lilith, and the second edition of Lilith and Thomas Wingfold. Uh, if, if, I had, if I had time right now, I think I would really like to translate at least seven more of his novels and do a good translation of his fairy tales. That would be just really, really lovely if I could do that. Uh, but uh, the characters, the, again, they're never far away. Uh, you know, and I could spend an hour telling you my favorite stories from George MacDonald. But look, this is dear Dr. Hind, by the way, whom I met in 2000, <laughs> yes, in 2010. And I came here to, um, uh, again, to work on George MacDonald biography. And I'm still working at it um, so, and hope to 
finish it, God willing, next year. Next year. Uh, this is uh, Scottish Parliament, where they feature a quote by George MacDonald, right on the wall there. Yeah. Uh, and again, lots and lots of quotes. For his birthday, I would usually post something about George MacDonald and the poetry uh, and some, uh, again, news about George MacDonald. And look at this. Every man who can, who can should help his people to inherit the earth by bringing into his own of the wealth of other tongues. George MacDonald. Did you know he was a translator too? He's a fellow translator from German. So he knows what he's talking about. And this is in honor, this is what I post in, uh, on International Translators Day, which is the 30th of September. So he was a fellow translator, and I am too. So I was encouraged by uh, his quote. Uh, and again, more news, more poetry, more quotes in Russian, you know, translations, little bits and pieces. How to bring up children from George MacDonald, who had 11 children from the vicar's daughter. <laughs> you know, so again, uh, whenever I read MacDonald, I would find something and I would translate and post it, you know, for other people to see. Even if I can't translate more novels just yet, I can do this a little bit, little bits and pieces. Um, with amazement, I found this, I'm just translating this quote. With amazement, I found Donald Grant made into a beautiful audiobook and posted in a major Russian Orthodox website. So somebody took our translation, made it into an audiobook, and made it available for the people. I say, great, no? <laughs> yeah, they didn't ask us about the copyright. That's OK. Uh, uh, so again, more quotes and quotes and quotes. But this is uh, a favorite. It says, do you see? This is news about the musical, The Light Princess, which we put together in 2015. Uh, for about 15 years, uh, our team would put together a musical every summer for a teenage camp. Uh, it's about 70 children, about half and half Christians and non-Christians. And we would write an original musical, most of the time Bible-based or you know, with a Christian message, and we would put it together and perform it for friends and family just one time. And one of the musical was The Light Princess. And it was great, <laughs> even if I say so myself. Uh, this is the poster for the musical. And we had, believe it or not, George MacDonald. <laughs> uh, he is my publisher, Sergei Palikin, who lives in Nizhny Novgorod, and he very kindly agreed to play George MacDonald. Uh, uh, these are some of the, uh, some of the uh, stills, but I've actually decided to show you a few bits and pieces from that. Are you game? Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. The first one, I just wanted to show you a few sections of George MacDonald. Uh, so that you can appreciate. And again, you'll have to read the subtitles. So please pay attention. <laughs> can you see? This is from the Fantastic Imagination, an essay written by George MacDonald. So we you know, made, gave a little preface so that people would understand what was going on. This is just a little taste of the princess and the prince. И как не ждал я чуда, не думал, не хотел, явилась ниоткуда, и я почти взлетел. О чудное видение, Невинной красоты, не знавшая падения, передо мной, как сон явилась ты, и к 
brilha abrão Sabor do ai alma e brilha abrão Sabor do ai alma e brilha abrão Sabor do ai alma e já te estou triste E brilha abrão Sabor do ai alma e brilha abrão Sabor do ai alma e brilha abrão Sabor do ai alma e já te estou triste Вот так легко и просто. This is a teaser. Uh, but the whole camp was spent actually uh, talking about, because uh, uh, we would have like morning uh, reflection. And we spent the whole camp talking about how the magical fairy tale, any true magic fairy tale, is a reflection of the true myth of the true myth of God coming in. And we talked about the grand cosmic fairy tale that always has a good end. And I wanted to show you the finale of the musical all about that. А злая принцесса, я ж вам дам, еще раз убедилась, что как бы злые колдуньи не старались, как бы не хитрили и не обманывали, в конце концов, они сами способствуют тому, чему пытались помешать. И даже если порой кажется, что зло вот-вот победит, на самом деле всех нас всегда ждет только самое благое благо, хотя мало кто осмеливается просто и неизменно в это поверить. Хороший конец нашу сказку венчает. Прости, Голливуд, только ты ни при чем. Топ ни были мы, нас всегда ожидает. Вселенская сказка с хорошим концом. В сказочном царстве пили и ели, не зная тревог, Но глупо подались чужому коварству И сами пустили беду на порог Злодейство пустили на царские троны Впустили злодейство в умы и сердца Но есть в нашей сказке властитель законы И он не допустит плохого конца Не бойтесь, ребята, ведь автор всей сказки В придуманный мир незаметно вошел И сделал хороший, плохую развязку С собой исправил вселенский раскол Драконом стразился и умер, но снова в день третий, ликуя из гроба восстал. Вселенскую сказку он прожил и новый счастливый, счастливый конец для нее написал. С тех пор даже зло не вредит нам немало, и слезы не портят родного лица. И всякий конец это только начало, начало чудес и любви без конца. И однажды наш автор блаженное царство нас всех приведет И старая сказка окажется правдой И тот, кто поверил во век и Это мы сказку своей завершаем Кто слушал и слышал, большой молодец Не бойтесь, друзья Мы читали и знаем и Сказка вселенской хорошей конец Yes, uh, I did write the book and the lyrics uh, for, for our musicals, but it was such a, again, to, to, to have the kids live through this and sing this through, and I don't know where in life it's going to come up, but, you know, I have to believe that it will. It's, uh, you know, the word of God will not come back empty, right? <laughs> um, the time is drawing to an end, and I still have two authors to talk about, don't I? <laughs> Dorothy Sayers. Um, uh, I met her a little later in 98. I was in St. Louis uh, doing a year at Covenant Th Theological Seminary on my sabbatical from student work. And my host, uh, it was a residential Labrie branch that I was uh, staying with the Labrie family, uh, the Bradshaws. And Wade Bradshaw, who was working at Francis Schaeffer Institute at that time, uh, he had a great library. And he one day he handed me a book, Gaudy Night. He said later in lectures and to other people, I've never seen a Russian shaken so badly. <laughs> uh, I've never seen a book affect anyone so much. Uh, I cannot tell you what it did uh, to me, that book. Uh, because, well, to me, it's a book about intellectual and emotional integrity. It was a book about integrity. And uh, as one of the characters in the book says to the main character, Harriet Vane, she says, if somebody can love you because 
you love the truth, you value the truth and integrity more than other things, not in spite of it, but because of it. This is a great love indeed. And uh, it was unbelievable. It was about the truth. It was about univer well, university too, but it was about the truth, emotional, intellectual integrity. And then, of course, very quickly followed by Busman's Honeymoon. And this is the book about love, true love. And it's almost like, after this book, I want no less. This is what I want. You know, this is what I want in a love or in a marriage. I don't know, because this is, this is it, love with honor, no possessiveness. Uh, we, we take possessiveness and we chuck it overboard, as Lord Peter says. Uh, and then uh, another book that I read immediately was a biography of Dorothy Sayers by James Barbizon. And it was just, of course, I read other biographies later, but this was my first love. And I just completely fell in love with um, everything and started reading up a storm, everything that Dorothy Sayers wrote. Uh, and she basically spoiled me for bad writing. She's such a good writer. Uh, you know, I, uh, she, her prose is so muscular. There's no froth, it's all muscle. Uh, she's so witty and so funny. There's always a game of quotation, right? She quotes things, and if you know the quotation, you will catch it and there will be a game. If you don't know, fine. But I will never forget, I was uh, watching Richard II in English uh, for the first time, and I was like, oh! That's another quotation from God Unite. Oh, that's another quotation from Busman's Honeymoon. I didn't know. I didn't grow up reading Shakespeare in the original, so I don't necessarily know the wording. But now that I'm getting more and more familiar with the English literature, I uh, the game becomes even more fun. I always tell my students: the more you know, the more you laugh because there's just you just see more jokes. <laughs> that's all. And uh, again, I quote her a lot, apparently, on my pages. And one of my favorite poems of all times is Christ the Companion. If you haven't read it, oh, do. It's uh, quite amazing. Uh, and again, lots and lots of quotes, lots and lots of quotes. Uh, one of my favorites is about uh, the, how the distinctive ability of a human being is discursive reasoning coming from unknown to the known, and it's distinctly human. And I remember thinking, so if I'm helping my students to reason from what they know to what they don't know, I am essentially helping them to become more human. That was an important thought in my, te in my teaching life. And that uh, I thank Dorothy Sayers for this. And of course, again, she is enormous fun. Uh, so many jokes. Uh, nothing is gained by confusion of mind and the use of inaccurate language. That is so true. Uh, and I absolutely loved her Man Born to be King. I don't know if you know that series of radio plays, but if you haven't heard them, if you haven't read them, oh, please do. And again, uh, it has been such a fruitful part of my Ignatian journey and other people's Ignatian journey because this is what she does. She takes you to that time and helps you walk with Jesus through the gospel, through Jesus' life. Um, Right? This is Russian. Uh, this is Natalia Trauberg, who started translating uh, Dorothy Sayers. She translated Zeal of uh, His House uh, and many other things. And she did translate. This is an article about the Wade Center, by the way, that she wrote. It was an introduction to a book of, of translations from Dorothy Sayers. And she talks about all the seven Wade authors. And she introduces the Russian writers uh, and readers to Dorothy Sayers. And I do assign Dorothy Sayers in the classroom, too. Uh, this is translation class, and I find her, this is a passage from God Unite. And uh, this is a very difficult passage, but I don't tell my students that from the start. <laughs> uh, this, I think it's one of the best descriptions you know, in the English language. Uh, I give them a dictation from the mind of the maker. Uh, I, again, the, such creative thinking about the writing process, the Trinitarian thinking. Uh, we do a dictation about the house from Busman's Honeymoon. And this is the seniors. My seniors read her really, really funny paragraph from uh, about the advertising agency that she worked in. And we talk about uh, suppression of truth and suggestion of falsehood and what that means. And we talk about her take on advertising. And of course, when we watch the TV series Friends, I always point out the poster about Guinness. And I say, this is Dorothy Sayers. This is Dorothy Sayers. <laughs> you know, because she did design, she did come up with the idea for Oh, my goodness, my, my Guinness, right? Yeah. Uh, and 
I'm afraid this is just a mishap, but this is supposed to be man born to be king. Uh, but this is the Russian version of the radio plays because it was translated and it was done into a beautiful series of radio plays uh, by our leading actors about 20 years ago. And this year, as I was uh, leading a small group through Ignatian exercises, it was the first time I said, you guys, okay. Um, and Val McIntyre, who's sitting right over there, um, uh, one of the exercises you suggested was listening to those plays. And I knew that they exist this is in Russian, so I asked my uh, group to listen to them, and at first they were a bit reluctant, as one is, with new things, but then everybody starts saying, oh, this is so good, isn't it? This is so good. And, and, and now, lo and behold, they started recommending it to everybody else, and now the whole church is listening to the plays, and everybody's just loving it. Just like the C.S. Lewis, and like he said everything, the same thing. Dorothy Sayers is amazing, isn't she? Jesus is just so good, isn't he? Yes, he is. Um, so yeah, one last person to talk about, another, my great love number four is Charles Williams. And he was probably the latest, uh, you know, the, well, not probably, he was the latest. And I had heard about him from Dorothy Sayers. Uh, I knew that they were friends. I knew that they corresponded about Dante. Uh, and Charles Williams, uh, in the biography, I read a letter from Charles Williams to Dorothy Sayers. Dorothy Sayers had a lot to say about work. And that is also something that endeared her to me. Uh, I love working properly. I love work, and she loved work, and she saw work as something really, really good, and I do too. So she and I, we converse about work. Uh, and then uh, when Dorothy Sayers, she was big on proper work, talked about proper work. And then Charles Williams, in one of the letters, very gently and very sternly said to her, um, maybe you should think about duty too, and obedience, really sweetly. And I thought, man, this guy, that's amazing. And then I met another author, Evelyn Underhill, um, who is, has become one of my masters too. And I read Charles Williams' preface to her letters. And again, his writing is just uh, amazing. And then a friend gave me a Charles Williams reader, which had descent into hell, many dimensions were in heaven. Here's my reaction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, I'm going to quote Dorothy Sayers, who said, uh, C.S. Lewis is a highly disciplined talent, but Charles Williams is the original genius. Um, and without any disloyalty to C.S. Lewis, I, knew, I know what she's talking about. Uh, I think I want to be a highly disciplined talent, because I'm no genius. But, uh, but his, his books, again, it's just uh, and Dor Natalia Trauberg. She was asked to translate his books, and they now exist. All of his novels exist in Russian. Uh, they're there. But they are sold as mystical thrillers. They're sold in the horror section, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, and Natalia Chalberg, actually, when she talked about it, she was afraid that his novels were, are going to get lost in the horror literature. And she was kind of right. Uh, but she was commissioned to translate Williams in the early 90s. And her testimony, I, I'm quoting, she said, I was looking at it and I thought, how can one translate this? How does one translate this? Beca and that's my experience too, as I'm reading Williams. Uh, I'm being, I, I see one meaning, I sort of see the second meaning, the third meaning I can feel hovering about. <laughs> The fourth meaning I discern, and there's probably more that I don't see. So they're like, all of this, there's this mystical, almost palpable atmosphere uh, just around the text. And uh, it's also enormous fun to read. Uh, Many Dimension is about a stone. Uh, and every time I read about Jesus' miracles in the Gospels, you know, how Jesus, you know, uh, gave the bread to the people or healed people, I always think of the many dimensions, how there was a stone that healed people. And it's, it's, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, th that's right. This, and it, it really gives me an understanding of how people reacted to Jesus when he was doing these things. How everybody why you wanted a piece of him. Uh, and it's like, oh yeah, that's right. And he does it so imaginatively, he does it so well. But you know what, the, one of the best things for me about Williams, uh, this is Tauberg, by the way, again, um, is that when I read his uh, History of the Church, the, the book called The Descent of the Dove, uh, it's a church history, it's the same 
miraculous, wonderful, fantastic, burlesque narrative. It doesn't matter if it's real or fiction. It's just as amazing, you know? And you read that book uh, like fantastic fiction, because, and it's true. And the quality of the writing is absolutely the same. It's just as magical. It's just as fantastic, just as full of meaning. Uh, so the, it was my favorite reading of church history is Williams, but it's a bit frustrating. Do you know why? It says, this is how I feel when I read Charles Williams, one of my absolutely favorite authors. The more you read, the more you understand that you understand about one-tenth of his thoughts and images. And the more you, uh, he, and it says, a funny mix of frustration absolute excitement and yearning for a better education. <laughs> you know, uh, and of course, C.S. Lewis, about when he was talking about Williams, he said, well, of course, he doesn't have formal education. I was like, yeah, I wish I didn't have formal education like that. You know, this is, uh, Williams is uh, amazing. And the way he talks about God, he calls him the impossible, right? And I always live, when I read Williams, I live in the tension. I, I see the tension. He says, he talks about the impossible, doing his impossible work in me, and I know what he means. And he talks about, uh, he answers some really serious objections and some serious uh, questions and doubts so well, and with such humility, again, I'm quoting Dorothy Sayers, uh, Peter can always see the problem, that's what's so disarming, and Charles Wilson can always see what the problem is, and he answers it compassionately and with great insight. Um, see, this is my Facebook status. It deserved, it was like this long. So, <laughs> uh, but it was so good. Accuracy, accuracy, and again, accuracy. Accuracy of mind and accuracy of emotion. A challenge from Charles Williams. I mean, I always live with that. Uh, found the name of my city, Nizhny Novgorod, and Charles Williams, the descent of the dove. Ridiculously happy. Uh, the history of Christendom, like the personal history of Christian, is full of the remarkable fulfillments of Christ's promise to give back the full measure of what it has given. Isn't this amazing? Isn't this muscular prose? Islam versus Christianity, the incarnate alone versus the co-inherent and incarnate. Chew on that for a while. This is, do you, do you see the, the depth and the meatiness of this? Uh, Caught myself reading Charles Williams' play Thomas Cramer of Canterbury through the rhythms and tunes of Hamilton. It works surprisingly well. <laughs> uh, I loved it. Not one mind. This is very pertinent to modern discussions on Facebook and in politics. Not one mind in a thousand can be trusted to state accurately what his opponent says, much less what he thinks. Right? Uh, and again, Place of the land, just lots and lots of more exciting, more snow, sigh. I'm just going to accept it, Charles Williams like, as a different kind of beauty to be enjoyed, perfectly opposed to the beauty of clear skies and blooming daffodils. <laughs> and this is again, I owe this to Charles Williams, this whole uh, adore the mystery of love and the different kind of beauty. Uh, and again, uh, he is, he knew how to turn a phrase. It's just really, really true. Uh, so whenever I get down, and again, we all have different ways of coming close to God, and whenever I feel really down and kind of blah and not stimulated, one of my go-tos is go to Charles Williams, get some spark in that brain, you know, get some challenge, get some whoomph in that head of yours. Um, the under the mercy, uh, anybody who's read Charles Williams would recognize under the mercy or in the omnipotence. And again, this is just again, such a Charles Williams phrase. And I will, I treasure the story of how C.S. Lewis and Tolkien made sure that Charles Williams came to um, Oxford, I think, to lecture on Milton. And he said, I have at least, I have at last, if only for once, seen a university doing what it was founded to do, teaching wisdom. And that's about Charles Williams' lecture. And it's such a challenge to me as a teacher. Am I teaching wisdom? You know, and it's such a challenge to me. So yeah, these are friends and masters. Four last points. I think I love them because they tackled difficult issues with integrity, c clarity, and wit. Just this morning, I read an article about a young uh, Hillsong uh, worship leader who walked away from the faith. And uh, the letter was, uh, what about uh, incongruities in the Bible? Nobody's talking about it. 
What about uh, the suffering? Nobody's talking about it. What about this? Nobody's talking about this. And the response in the article was, we are talking about it. Where have you been? Everybody's talking about it. <laughs> and I thought, well, these guys talking about it all the time. They're the best apologists, right? I mean, uh, but they have tackled really difficult issues so well. And you don't have to have a PhD in English literature to understand. Well, not all of them, but. And another thing is it's not just their books, it's their whole lives. I'm looking at their lives, I'm looking at their challenges, I'm, I'm trying to be what they're telling me to be. Uh, I'm accepting the challenge from them, from their lives. I wanna be like C.S. Lewis, I do. <laughs> I wanna be like George MacDonald, I really do. You know, because they were outstanding examples of how to be a Christian. Uh, and of course, C.S. Lewis said about George MacDonald, he's the closest thing that I know to the spirit of Christ. Now that's a compliment. And I, say, I think that these write the good like nobody else. I don't know about you, my imagine, uh, imagination of evil, no problem. Imagining evil, easy. Uh, when I was a little girl, I was asked to play a good girl in a school play. And I was like, how does one play a good girl? <laughs> Playing a Baba Yaga, Baba the Yaga or the witch, you know, that's not a problem, an evil dragon, no problem at all but playing a good girl. And a lot of people say, well, you know, heaven is so boring, it's just too good. You know, world will be boring without evil. They don't know what they're talking about. They just, they, their imagination is starved. And I think a lot of our imagination is starved. We, we imagine evil so easily, but we have such a hard time imagining the good. Well, these guys, they brush up the cobwebs from the mind, from the heart. Their good is so compelling. You believe it. And because it's the best that the humanity can produce, isn't it? I mean, and I think we all need a good, solid diet of good imagination. So these are my go-to for the good. And um, I'm gonna quote Marge Mead, who gave me one of the greatest compliments ever in my life. She said, well, Olga, I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, you're kind of living like the authors. <laughs> and I just kind of stood there and I thought, wow, if this ever is true, I will die a happy woman <laughs> because, uh, but this is my ambition basically. Uh, it, it is my ambition because they are my friends and masters and we do continue the conversation in Bakhtin fashion, you know, because the, the conversation never ends. So, uh, and I hope that uh, judging by your reactions, they are your friends too. But if they're not, may I invite you to this friendship? It's <laughs> exciting. Thank you. <laughs> take five minutes maybe for if there's any pressing questions and then you could always come and ask Olga any other questions that you might have. Is there someone who really has a question that you want to deliver? Thank you very much You're for this welcome. inspiring lecture. I want to uh, I was taken by the McDonald books in the library of your university. So that means that the acquisitions librarian knew to get them. Tell me about the librarian in your library. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was not the librarian. It was the InterVarsity Global Projects. Um, it was Wheaton. It was Wheaton's InterVarsity students and staff workers who came to Russia to in 91, 92, and I think 93, and then 2000. And they led an evangelistic uh, global project where American Christians and Russian students were paired up and we spent a month together. I became a Christian as a result of one such project, quite unexpectedly for myself and for everybody. Uh, but they, along with uh, themselves, brought us books and films, so that's how uh, a collection of C.S. Lewis and a collection of George MacDonald and some Bibles and some other things ended up in our university library. So it's through the generosity of uh, folks here in Wheaton. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank Olga again thank for you being with us tonight. <laughs>